Sam lived in a nightmare for several days. He constantly looked for food, going to the market, exchanging some things he took from his house for bread, milk, or a pie, which gave him a stomach ache. One day, Aunt Clara, his father's sister, came. Sam told her how his dad disappeared, how police took Mike, and how his mom died. I wanted to find you and Uncle Aaron, but I didn't know where you lived. She listened and cried. Do you want to live with us? Yes. Sam was glad. I'll try to talk Uncle Aaron into it. She thought a little. Actually, I have a plan. I'll come tomorrow with a cart to take your things to our new home. What new home? Sam asked. We moved into a new house. Don't you know that all Jews have to live in the ghetto now? The next day, the cart came. Two grumpy men started to remove everything from the house and load it into the cart. Sam thought that they would take only his things, but they took everything. From their conversation, the boy learned that they were going to take it all for themselves. There were fur coats, suits, dresses, jewelry, houseware, and furniture there. And everything was of good quality and expensive because Sam's dad had been a doctor and had money. Aunt Clara, why are they taking all my things? The boy was upset. I have an agreement with them. They take all your stuff, and in return, they adopt my daughter, Rena, to live with them. She'll be in Belarus from now on. She'll live with them outside the ghetto, and you'll live with us in the ghetto as our son. Sam didn't want to give away his things, especially the ones that his parents bought for him on the first day of the war. He ran to the drawer and grabbed the first thing that was there. It was a pair of socks. He wanted to grab something else, but one of the men approached him, took the socks from his hands, and asked, Are they yours? He nodded. The man gave the socks back to the boy. Okay, then keep them, and go to your aunt. This pair of socks was the only thing that Sam had from his parents. Uncle Aaron met Sam with indifference, and soon the boy learned that they didn't want him there. They ate without him, ignoring his presence, gave him different work to do. And always complained that he did it wrong. Gentiles had permission to come into the ghetto, but they were not allowed to stay overnight. Rena visited her real parents every week, on Saturday or Sunday. When Aunt Clara always asked her about her life with her new family, Rena never complained, but she missed her real family very much. One Sunday, Rena visited her parents as usual. In the evening, she left the ghetto, but soon ran back. They ran away, she cried. They took everything with them. They took my furniture. Sam thought. What? They took my furniture? Uncle Aaron yelled. He was mad. Yes. The house is empty. I'm going to find them. Uncle Aaron yelled. I'm going to kill them. He wanted to run after them. Aaron! Stop that! Aunt Clara shouted. You can't leave the ghetto without a permit, and it's too late to get it today. You'll try tomorrow. The next day, Uncle Aaron got the permit and went to Rena's Gentile parents' house. He knocked on the neighbors' doors, but they didn't want to talk to a Jew. Uncle Aaron didn't find anything new. Sam's things were gone. Rena became Jewish again and lived with her real parents. There was another special ghetto in Minsk that people called Ghetto Hamburg. The Germans deported Jews from Hamburg, Germany into this ghetto, therefore, only the German Jews lived there. Ghetto Hamburg was located next to the ghetto, for the local Jews, where Sam lived. Strangely, Hamburg Jews came there on passenger trains, carrying a lot of their belongings, and the Germans didn't guard them. Hamburg Jews were rich in comparison to the locals. Also, they hated local Jews, accusing them of supporting Soviets and Hitler. There were no jobs in the ghetto, so the Hamburg Jews had to exchange their belongings for food. They knew only German and Yiddish and always needed a translator to negotiate the exchange with natives. Therefore, their wealth melted away by the minute, and soon they became much poorer than the locals. People gathered on the street that was the border between the two ghettos. Hamburg Jews brought their jewelry, household items, and other things. 
locals came there too, offering translation services. Because they all spoke Yiddish and Belarusian. Children were more popular, because they were paid less, so Sam also made some money. Suddenly, the Germans started the extermination of Jews and carried out these actions nonstop. They killed the Hamburg Jews first and then the locals. At first, extermination actions were unexpected. But then, the guerrillas let Jews know the day of the extermination and what group of people the Germans planned to kill so that people could hide. An empty brick shell of a two-level house without a roof or windows was standing right next to Aunt Clara's house. We could use this house as a hiding place. Uncle Aaron suggested, talking to Aunt Clara. I can ask the police to seal all the doors and windows of this house so that nobody can hide there. They might grant me permission. If you seal it, how could we hide in it? We'll dig a tunnel from our house. Oh. It's a great idea, dear. You might tell them that you are expecting to be paid for this job, otherwise, they would be suspicious. Uncle Aaron received a permit from the Germans and organized his friends to do the job. They also brought the tools and necessary materials and dug the underground tunnel from Aaron's house to the destroyed house at night. They removed dirt, packed it into bags, and carried it out through Uncle Aaron's house. They worked in great secrecy, being afraid that others would denounce them to the Germans or local police because of jealousy or fear. The entrance into the tunnel was made underneath a furnace that was used for cooking between extermination actions. Sometimes, Uncle Aaron brought the police to his house so they could see the furnace at work. When the guerrillas warned them about an upcoming extermination action, Uncle Aaron stopped using the furnace to cool it down. People came to his house, went through the tunnel, and hid in the destroyed house. At the bottom of the furnace was a trapdoor to the tunnel. In the tunnel, there was a camouflage trapdoor that had coal and the remains of burned wood glued to it. When everybody got into the tunnel, the last one replaced the regular trapdoor with the camouflaged one. The destroyed house could fit 15 to 20 people. There was no floor there, so people could only sit on the ground. There was no roof there, so most of the time the ground was wet and muddy because of the rain or snow. Later, someone brought some wooden planks, which were better to sit on than the wet dirt. However, people generally stood because it was hard to sit, while bearing the fear. Usually, an extermination action lasted for several hours, but sometimes for two, three, or even four days, and all that time, the people in hiding had to survive without making any noise. After several hours of standing in complete silence, they would lie down on wooden planks or wet ground in puddles or snow. They had to remain in absolute silence to prevent the police or the Germans from hearing them, and then, everybody would die. Sometimes, the Germans caught runaway Jews and executed them on the other side of the hiding house wall. People in hiding heard as these poor people begged for forgiveness, prayed, and wept, then shots, then the weak cries or shouts of the wounded that were not dead yet. Then, single shots that finished the job. Then came the sound of Germans walking away, and then there was silence again. Sometimes, someone among the people in hiding recognized his relative or friend that was executed. He cried silently, and the others grabbed him tight and were ready to cover his mouth in case he suddenly cried out loud in grief. Once, an extermination action lasted for several hours. The weather was dry and the sun was warming people up. There were two or three women with little kids among others, in the hiding place. Usually, the children behaved and were quiet because the whole terrifying atmosphere affected them. This time, a two-year-old boy asked for a drink. Unfortunately, the people had ran out of water and were suffering from thirst. The extermination action lasted for too long. The mother tried to calm her child, but he started to cry. She held him very tight, desperately whispering something into his ear and covering his mouth with her palm, only letting him breathe through his nostrils. The child moved his entire body, trying to get out of her embrace. If she didn't hold him, he would scream from the bottom of his lungs. But even though she covered his mouth, he produced a weak mooing sound that was enough to be heard from the other side and cost them their lives. Everyone was afraid and got very nervous. 
several men surrounded the poor woman, trying to take her child away from her. What are they doing? Sam asked Aunt Clara, whispering. They want to kill him so that nobody else will be killed, she whispered back to him. The woman held her boy, unable to fight the men. Somebody covered the boy's nostrils, and the boy looked at everybody in terror. Several men grabbed the mother. Also covering her mouth and nose so that she wouldn't produce any noise. Even though there were several men against one woman, she shook them with enormous force. Then, she got tired and quiet, and they let her go. Her face was dirty and tear-stained, and her dress was ripped. The man that held the child asked him whispering, Are you going to be quiet? The boy nodded, and the man let him go. I just want to drink, the little boy said quietly, and before he produced another sound, the mother grabbed a rusty can from the ground, pulled her skirt up and her pants down with swift motion, pushed the can in between her legs and peed into it. Sam was shocked by what was happening in front of his eyes. He never saw a naked woman in his life, and was not able to take his eyes off her smooth big buttocks, stomach, and bent legs. The people stood quietly around her, and only a bubbling sound was heard. Then, she got up and gave the can with urine to her baby boy to drink, and he drank greedily. Sam was the only survivor among all those people in hiding. In one way or another, they were all killed. The winter was coming, and getting food became an acute problem. Sam starved all the time, the same as everybody else. There was no food in the ghetto. However, it was possible to find some food in the dumpsters outside it. Germans didn't allow Jews to leave the ghetto without permission, rather, they only gave permission to people who were sent to work outside, and there weren't too many jobs available. Permits were only granted to those who were strong enough to work while all others were condemned to die from starvation. People who tried to get outside without a permit risked being caught and shot to death, and children were more successful at it than adults. It was needless to ask Belarusians or Russians for help. Neither pity for Jews, especially taking into consideration that they also struggled to find food. Jews had to sew a yellow six-angled star on their clothes, so it was easy to see them among the others. Aunt Clara mastered sewing a yellow star in such a way that, if necessary, Sam could pull a string and remove the star from his jacket. He used this technique when he got outside the ghetto through different gaps. Only Uncle Aaron and Sam were able to bring some food to the family. Sometimes, Uncle Aaron brought food that looked like it was from a store. Nobody knew where he got it, and he kept it a secret. Later, the family found out that he got it from gorillas. Sam knew a few a secret holes in a ghetto wall, so he could get outside the ghetto and dig out something edible in a garbage heap. And sometimes, it was all the family would eat that day. Sometimes, other boys took away the food he found. Jewish and Gentile children used their strength to rob the weaker kids. Sometimes, Sam ran away from robbers, but most of the time they beat him up and took away all he had. It was hard to escape from kids. Adults also took advantage of children, though it was easier to get away from adults. Sam either started crying or jumped into a little opening in a wall where they couldn't reach him. Once, Sam overheard an argument between Uncle Aaron and Aunt Clara. And I'm telling you, I don't even know if they'll let me stay with them. I can't ask them to take a baby. He is not a baby. He is a big boy, and I'm not leaving him here. Well, you are not taking him with you. And this is the end of the conversation. He's going to be just fine here alone. He would be better off without us. Look at him. Sometimes, he is the only one who can feed the whole family. Exactly. And you want to leave him here alone? That's enough. Your voice doesn't count, he yelled at her, and she cried. Uncle Aaron planned to run away from the ghetto, to the gorillas, leaving Sam behind. Sam heard these kinds of conversations several times. And every time Uncle Aaron would glance at him with anger. Being afraid of treason, gorillas were very careful with newcomers. They didn't accept everyone because they didn't have enough food to feed everybody, and they also needed fighters. Therefore, women and children were not welcome. 
Uncle Aaron planned to go there alone to try to fit in and bring his family to the guerrillas. He also planned to kill a couple of Germans to prove his devotion to the guerrillas, as well as his ability to fight. It was harvest time. Uncle Aaron contacted the police again. People emptied the potato fields that are near the city. If you send a truck with a couple of guards and a couple of Jews to the potato field farther away, we can fill the truck with potatoes for the Germans. A big German truck with two German guards, a German driver, and four starving but still strong Jews, including Uncle Aaron, went to the field. The field was about 25 kilometers away from the city. When they arrived, the Germans sent the Jews to work. Two Jews dug potatoes, while another two stalked them into the truck. The Germans watched them for some time. But then got bored and tired, and decided to enjoy themselves. They prepared a picnic, made a fire, and fried some potatoes. At five in the afternoon, the Germans permitted the Jews to take a break. The Jews also made a fire, baked some potatoes, ate, and rested. However, the Germans didn't let the Jews rest for too long, and in about 40 minutes, ordered them to continue working. The Jews put the fire out. Two of them headed to the field empty-handed, while the other two followed them with shovels on their shoulders. They walked on the trail that took them right next to the Germans, who lazily sat by the warm fire after the large meal that filled their stomachs. Their machine guns lay on the ground, right next to them. The first two empty-handed men walked slowly passing by the Germans. The other two came closer and suddenly attacked the Germans, brandishing the shovels and cracking their heads. The next moment, they had already run to the truck, where the German driver rested. He tried to run away, but was too late. He prayed, calling for his mother, but it didn't help him. They strangled him with their bare hands. The Jews stripped the dead Germans, buried them, hid the truck in the forest, then dressed in the German uniforms, and went looking for the guerrillas. They had a week to find the guerrillas and rescue their families from the ghetto. They knew that within a week, the Germans would start looking for the truck and would come after their families. Everything went smoothly. They found the guerrillas, and the German uniforms that they wore proved how many Germans they had killed and that they could be trusted. They also brought potatoes and the truck filled with gas. That was more than enough to be accepted into the guerrillas' team. Three days later, a courier agent came to Aunt Clara's house. It was a 13-year-old Jewish girl. She was very thin and looked sick. She didn't have proper warm clothes for the freezing weather and was cold, constantly covering herself tighter into her ripped kerchief. She came with an assignment to bring Aunt Clara, Rena, a ghetto doctor, and a nurse, to the guerrillas. The doctor and the nurse came to Aunt Clara's house to discuss the escape from the ghetto. I was ordered to lead four of you to the guerrillas, the girl said, and we have to bring medical supplies and medications. What about the boy? Aunt Clara asked. I was ordered to bring only four people, the girl said firmly. Well, we'll make it five then, Aunt Clara insisted. I'm in charge of the operation, the thin girl answered forcefully. I'll take only the people that I named. In that case, I'm not going. I'm not leaving him here alone. Aunt Clara was adamant. Also, keep in mind that if I don't come with you, they will punish you for not bringing me to them, she threatened. The girl started to cry, please. They told me, if I bring more people, they'd shoot me. Everybody got emotional. Just leave the boy here, what's the matter with you, the nurse yelled. He is an orphan. I'm the only one he has. He'll die without me, Aunt Clara yelled back. There are too many orphans. Take all of them then. If you were a mother, you wouldn't say so. I was. My baby died. Why do I care? You don't care about my boy. He is not your boy. He is nobody's boy. Stop that, the doctor shouted, but they fought, non-stop. I said, shut your mouths, you too. I said that I'm not going without him. Aunt Clara didn't give up. Enough, the doctor took charge, and everybody got quiet. We'll take the boy with us. But, the girl was about to argue again. I said he is coming with us. 
we'll talk to the commander and confirm that it wasn't your fault. We'll confirm that we all refused to go without the boy. The doctor was a very respectful man. So the girl didn't have enough guts to argue with him and cried in fear. They planned to escape from the ghetto in the morning and discussed the roads they had to take and the time and place they had to meet after the escape. Take this road, the girl instructed Sam, showing him a map. It's not patrolled very often. I don't like that road, he replied. It's the poorest area of the city. The natives hate Jews the most there. It will be very early in the morning. Everybody will most likely still be sleeping. Sam took some of his clothes that were partially ripped and the socks, the ones that his parents bought on the first day of the war, the only thing that he had from his parents. He never wore them and called them my mom's socks. Aunt Clara sewed a special jacket for Sam with a lot of different pockets all around it. She put medications, surgical instruments, and different medical supplies into them. Sam put the jacket on and she wrapped him in bandages. Then, Sam put his regular dirty clothes on top of all that and looked like a ball. When the first rays of light touched the sky, they left the ghetto, taking different roads, so, in case somebody got caught, all the others would survive. Only Aunt Clara and Rena went together. Sam carried almost all the medications and medical supplies. The nurse carried only some bandages, and the doctor carried some surgical instruments that they couldn't fit into Sam's pockets. The boy took the biggest risk because he had all the proof that he was going to the guerrillas. If he were caught, the Germans would tear him apart. Sam went through a secret hole in a wall and found himself outside the ghetto. He walked one block, looked around, and removed the yellow star from his jacket, pulling the string. It was safer to walk outside the ghetto without a star. It was very difficult to walk because of the medical supplies Sam carried and the bandages wrapped around him also made him very hot. There were houses on one side of the road and a field on the other. Sam walked closer to the field, thinking that it was easier to run away from danger in a field. It was early in the morning, and the streets were deserted. He walked several blocks without any problems and started to get excited that he could finally go to the guerrillas and start fighting the Germans for his mom, dad, and brother. He made a turn into a street suddenly running into two boys. They all stopped. The boys immediately guessed that Sam was a Jew. The older grabbed his jacket collar. Where are you going, Kike? Sam didn't answer. Look. Basile. This Kike is so fat. Take off your jacket. You son of a bitch. Or we'll call the police. The two scoundrels held him very tight, so there was no way Sam could run away. He started to cry to buy some time as his brain ran fast, searching for options. If they saw what he carried under his jacket, they would take him to Germans, not even thinking twice. I have something special in my bag. The words just came out of his mouth. They looked at him suspiciously. Oh yeah? Show it. They released his hands to let him reach into his bag. He could run, but didn't, realizing that his jacket was too heavy, so he wouldn't able to run too fast. Sam didn't want to open his bag wide, because they would see medical supplies, so he searched with his hands inside it, and found his mom's socks. They were wrapped into an old cloth. His heart was racing. He removed them from the bag and unfolded them. The new socks had a store label and still smelled like they were just bought. Here, he said. They are new, from a store. I got them before the war. The forgotten smell of a new thing sent these boys wild and they instantly forgot about Sam. They grabbed the socks at once, pulling them into different directions, as Sam ran away. He ran as fast as he could and wept hard. He gave away the last thing that he had from his mom, with his bare hands. It was her last present. They were her socks. His mom's socks had saved his life. His poor mom had even protected him after her death. Then, the boys realized that Sam had run away and chased after him. Hey! Stop! Stop him! It's a kike without a star, they yelled and cursed, I'm going to catch you. Kike! I'm going to kill you! 
They threw rocks in Sam's direction, though he was too far away from them and they were not able to reach him anymore. Sam had to make a loop to avoid the two boys, though he could meet some other boys at some other place as well, but he was lucky. He was forty minutes late and was not sure if everybody would wait for him, but they did. They split up again and walked separately the rest of the way, keeping a visible distance from each other. The medical supplies that Sam carried were heavy, causing him to walk slower than everybody else. He was tired and starving, but luckily, he was not thirsty because he could drink from the forest streams and lakes. They walked the entire day, until the gorillas stopped them, coming out of a camouflaged ambush. The gorillas tied their eyes and hands and walked them slowly through the forest, transferring them from one guard to another. In about fifteen minutes, the covers were removed from their eyes, and they found themselves in the gorillas' detachment. A commander came out of the bunker, glanced at the agent girl, and sent for Uncle Aaron. He came fast and they all were glad to see him. He kissed his wife and daughter and shook hands with the doctor and the nurse, though he didn't even look in Sam's direction, as if the boy didn't exist. Why did you disobey the orders and bring extra people into the detachment, he asked the girl in a severe tone. Her lips started trembling. I told them that only four people could come. She was almost crying. But they refused to go without this boy. Comrade Commander. Uncle Aaron was merciless. She has to be arrested for violating the order. The boy has to be sent back to the city. Gorillas are not kindergartens. He is an orphan. Aunt Clara yelled at her husband, If you send him to the city, I'll go with him. The commander raised his hand. And everybody fell silent. I'll think about it. As of now, feed them and put her and the boy under arrest. The girl and Sam were locked in a prisoner bunker. She cried at first, and then became calmer. In about fifteen minutes, they were brought back to the commander. There were several men in the room, including Uncle Aaron, the commander, and the doctor. The doctor and Uncle Aaron were mad, glancing at one another with anger, ready to beat each other up. I investigated the matter and came to the conclusion that it's not your fault, the commander said to the girl. Her face lightened up. You did a good job, exactly as I ordered. You're released from the arrest. The girl left, and Sam stayed. The gorilla's life is tough. It's not for children. Uncle Aaron continued the conversation vigorously. There is no way he can stay here. He could be a courier agent, the commander said. I'll transfer him to other gorillas. If only they agree to take a little boy. Uncle Aaron didn't give up. Let's talk to the commander. We'll see what he says, the doctor interfered forcefully. Later that day, the commander from another detachment came. It looks like you are going to be a brave gorilla, he said, and Sam was excited. You have to promise me to do everything I say. I promise. Good. We'll go to our detachment tomorrow. It's going to be a long walk, so take a good rest. He shook Sam's hand, like adults do. Sam spent the night in a bunker with the two Jews who killed the Germans in the potato field. The next morning, he came to Aunt Clara and Rena to say goodbye. Uncle Aaron was not in the bunker, and Sam was glad he didn't want to see him. Aunt Clara hugged Sam tightly in her arms and kissed him on both cheeks. I'm so sorry, Sam. You take care of yourself. Okay? Her eyes were watery. He nodded and left. Then, he went to see the courier agent girl, who was laying on her bed under a blanket. When Sam came in, she got up, smiling at him for the very first time. My name is Sonia, she said. Sonia, I'm leaving. I know. I'm jealous. Why? Because your commander is Uncle Constantine. This is how Sam learned his commander's name. I'd love to be with him, she said. He is great. Is he your relative? No. I don't have any relatives. My parents were killed. I just know him. He is a very good man. I don't have anybody either, Sam said. I know. He wanted to say something nice to her, trying to look older. 
I'll never forget you, Sonia. She looked down with shyness, I'll never forget you either, Sam. Then, he left. Sam never saw the people from the detachment again. They didn't survive. A couple of months later, they were encircled by Germans and exterminated. Sam was not starving like in the ghetto, but the guerrilla's life was nerve-wracking and brutal. Uncle Constantine was very kind and sympathetic, and people loved and respected him. There were about 50 people in the group, including 15 Jews. The oldest Jew was Uncle Jacob. His son was drafted on the first day of the war. His battalion had been defeated, and all the soldiers and officers were killed. The young man miraculously survived and ran away back to his village. At that time Uncle Jacob was out of town. The next morning, the Germans occupied the village, and the neighbors betrayed his family. The Germans captured the family and killed them all, except for the young soldier. They ordered him to dig a hole in the ground. Then, they tied him up, threw the dead bodies into the hole, pushed the young soldier into the hole too, and buried him alive. Jacob came home the next day and was not able to even find the bodies of his loved ones. He turned his horse back and went into the forest. He looked for the gorillas for more than a week, until they stopped him, thinking that he was a traitor. Luckily, there were some people who knew him, and he was accepted into the group. Uncle Jacob and Sam lived together in the same bunker. They got attached to each other and took care of one another. There was a boy, ISA, in the detachment. He was a year older than Sam and was an orphan too. ISA taught Sam how to be a gorilla and helped him a lot. They became real friends and were together all the time. The chief of staff, Lieutenant Makarov, was there. He had the best reputation because, after being captured by Germans, he had managed to escape. Makarov was knowledgeable and experienced at war maneuvers and fights. He took care of everything and everybody during the fight, never overlooking any little detail, always covering everything and organizing defense and attack so that failure was not an option. If the operation was hard, Makarov went there himself. Uncle Constantine was very happy to have Makarov in the detachment. However, nobody else liked him. Makarov was very rude and cruel. He never let soldiers rest peacefully between fights, and it was common to see him picking on someone with or without a reason. There were about ten women in the detachment. Makarov sexually harassed almost all of them, especially the younger ones. Some of them liked it, whereas some others didn't and cried. Even though Uncle Constantine never harassed people, he also ignored Makarov's behavior. There was a beautiful 17-year-old Jewish girl, Ada, in the group. Before that war, she lived in Minsk. The Germans occupied the city and killed her parents, but she ran away. Ada was traumatized, having watched the Germans kill her best friend. Then, she was raped by Belarusian men. They wanted to kill her, but she managed to escape, hiding in a forest. She wandered in a forest for several days without any food and thought she would die. Then, she found the gorillas, but they didn't want to take her in. However, Makarov decided otherwise, giving her a dirty smile. Once at night, Sam ran in the forest and heard some noise. He got closer and saw Makarov and Ada. She fought Makarov silently, and he pushed her against a tree, trying to kiss her. Sam told Uncle Jacob about it, hoping that he would help her, but the old man nodded bitterly. You'd better keep away from Makarov. He is an evil man. Ada was a hard worker and quiet. Her glance was always gloomy because Makarov continually harassed her. There was so much grief that nobody paid too much attention to her misery, and no one wanted to protect her. She didn't have any other choice, so she tolerated Makarov and kept silent. In a few months, Sam became an experienced gorilla, a courier agent, and a spy. He played the role of a dirty homeless boy the best, walking near the German headquarters and memorizing everything he saw. He did his job so well that the German patrol never stopped him. Sometimes they chased him away or beat him up, and sometimes gave him a piece of bread or a cookie. However, nobody had a clue that he was a spy. 
Once, in wintertime, when Uncle Constantine went to another detachment, everybody was woken up very early in the morning. The entire group gathered at the staff bunker. Makarov held a machine gun in one hand and a pistol in another. Ada stood there without gloves and a hat, even though it was very cold. She looked awful, like she just wrestled some enemy. Her jacket had been ripped off and her face was livid, scratched, and tear-stained. She didn't have a gun and was quiet as usual. Makarov spoke emphatically, pointing his gun at her. Tonight, I was checking all the posts and found a sleeping guard, he said. It was her. He pointed at Ada. I arrested her and brought here for justice. Ada kept silent. She fought me during the arrest, he continued vigorously. She scratched me. She is a traitor and has to be executed. Ada cried quietly and fatefully. Nobody spoke. You. You. And you. Makarov pointed with his gun at the men from the group of people. Three steps ahead. The three men that he chose were Jews, and one of them was Uncle Jacob. Makarov pushed Ada against a big tree. Fire, he commanded. Nobody shot. There was a terrible heavy silence. Ada didn't make a sound. She didn't know how to speak up for herself. Her short life experience taught her that there was no reason to complain, but tolerate only, and she fatefully kept silent. Makarov glanced at the men with anger. Nobody ever disobeyed his command. Fire, he yelled again. They had to shoot, and they did, but they aimed someplace other than the chest or head. Ada fell down wounded and yelled suddenly. I didn't sleep. He attacked me. He raped me. Makarov jumped at her and shot her in the head several times. Ada bent her legs, convulsively, and died. All three men who shot her stood there in shock, holding their machine guns. Makarov turned around, showing his wry face. Everyone dismissed, he ordered. The people left, and only a funeral group remained to take care of Ada's body. Everybody waited for Uncle Constantine to hear what he would say. He didn't say anything, and soon the guerrillas' lives returned to normal. In a month, they fought the Germans under Makarov's command. During the fight, Uncle Jacob was killed and Makarov was wounded badly and carried from the battlefield to the detachment medical bunker. He moaned and cursed everybody, especially the Jews. When Uncle Constantine showed up in the medical banker, Makarov yelled. It's all these kikes' fault. What happened? That kike, Jacob shot me. We have to execute all of them. All of them are traitors. Where is Jacob? I killed him. What do you think? Should I bring him here and rip him into pieces? He shot me, son of a bitch. Makarov roared. Uncle Constantine said nothing and left the bunker. Jewish nurse Klava took care of Makarov. However, he kept insulting her Jewish origins and constantly harassed her verbally, so she stopped caring for him. He died in two days, alone, like a dog. When he was buried, nobody found a word to say at his grave. You have to remember Uncle Jacob all your life, Nurse Clava told Sam. He was like a father to all of us, and he loved you very much. I will, Sam said, and tears rolled down his cheeks. Uncle Constantine was a very reasonable man. He cared about people, and saved a lot of people during attacks. The Soviet slogan called for fighting to the last drop of blood. They must win or die. However, Uncle Constantine always tried to save people's lives, planning emergency retreats at all times. It was during the autumn of 1943 when the retreating Germans encircled the detachment. Uncle Constantine ordered everyone to spread out and secretly go through the encirclement in small groups. ISA and Sam went together, keeping away from towns, and instead going through dangerous swamps. They left the swamp to gather berries, mushrooms, and some edible grasses in nearby forests, but it was not enough. In a couple of days, they started to starve. Then, the boys got lucky, they found a dead horse that had been recently killed. They cut out big pieces of meat, gathered wood for a fire, 
and then waited for nighttime. During the day, smoke could be seen above the trees, and birds would come toward the smell of cooking meat. At night, the boys made a fire. They kept it small, to prevent sparks from flying high above the trees. They cooked the horse meat. And ate as much as they could to fill their stomachs. The next day, the meat had become rotten, and then, the boys started to starve again. They walked very carefully, sometimes making large loops, to ensure that nobody saw them. It was an exhausting journey. Once, the boys spotted a horse with a partially broken gear on it. They wanted to catch and kill it for food, but the horse didn't let them come close, walking away. They followed it determinately, trying to make it get used to them, but the horse was alert all the time and kept a safe distance. Sometimes, it stopped to eat grass, but as soon as the boys got closer, it got scared and walked away. The boys were tired, but the feeling of hunger was much stronger than being tired, so they kept walking after it. The horse walked up a hill and then stopped on top of it. The boys couldn't see what was on the other side of the hill. It stopped walking, Isa whispered. There is a reason for this. They stopped and waited. Look. It's moving its ears. The horse turned its head and looked at the boys. It feels some danger. There is somebody over that hill that it's afraid of. It's afraid of us too. The horse stayed on the top of the hill for some time, making a decision, and then disappeared behind it, but the boys didn't follow it. They waited. Sudden machine gun shots, the sound of a wounded horse, and the screams of Germans scared the boys away, so they ran off the road and into the forest. They ran quietly, hoping that the shooters didn't have dogs. They reached the swamp and stopped. That horse saved our lives, Isa said. If we had walked there, the Germans would have shot us instead. Do you think they will chase after us? I don't know. The dogs are not barking, Isa replied, then thought a moment and added. The horse has gear. If there is a horse with gear, there should be people nearby. Most likely they'll search the forest and the swamp. We'd better keep walking. So, they walked for the rest of the day, hungry and tired. When the sun went down, they found a tree with a big crown, climbed into it, camouflaged themselves with branches, and spent the entire night there, hiding inside the crown. The dark swamp below was scary, but it was even scarier and more dangerous to walk through the swamp in the dark. In the morning, a noise woke the boys up, and they rushed farther into the swamp. The voices behind them didn't lessen, so they kept running and soon found themselves in front of a small lake. Isa, I don't hear voices anymore, Sam said. If they have dogs, they are probably still going after us. So, let's hide, just in case. This lake is a good hiding place, Isa replied. The boys made a camouflage of willow branches, tying them to tree trunks under the water. They checked each other's hiding place, carefully examining them, and thought that they had camouflaged themselves very well. Then, they heard voices again, so it was obvious that somebody was after them. The boys went down under the water, breathing through reeds sticking above the water surface. Sam sat still and stopped breathing as shadows moved above his head. He didn't know what was happening. He was not sure if he had hidden well enough, but thought that Isa had. He would never have found him. If he didn't know the place where Isa was hiding. Suddenly, a shooting sound deafened him. His instinct pushed him to jump up and run, but he forced himself to sit still, like a rock, closing his eyes, and the water above him was calm and smooth. Sam had no idea how long he sat there, but it felt like an eternity. It had been quiet for a long time, and Sam finally decided to get out of the water, but it was not as easy as he thought it would. To his horror, he was not able to move his body, being numbed by the cold water. It felt like he had turned into a stone. Sam tried his hardest to move, but nothing worked. His mind was pounding. He concentrated on his right hand, moving his fingers first. It took a while to make them move. Then, he moved the entire hand, with tremendous difficulty. Then, he did the same with the other hand. It was a huge challenge for the boy to get to the water's surface, though it was only part of the job. 
He had to swim to the bank of the lake, but his hands and feet didn't obey. It was freezing cold. His mind made his body, hands, legs, and neck move, disregarding the pain. It was a short distance. But it was long enough to drown. Finally, Sam got out of the water and found ISA. His friend was lying on the ground near the lake. ISA. Sam called, but he didn't answer. He was dead. The Germans had found him, even though Sam thought it was impossible to see him under the water. Maybe he moved his reed accidentally, and the water movement revealed his location. Sam didn't know. He examined ISA's wounds and learned that they had first dragged him out of the water and then shot him to death. Sam sat next to his best and only friend's dead body and cried quietly. It was his first cry after he left the ghetto. He felt so sorry for ISA. He felt so lonely and lost. He felt as if the world had collapsed around him. He was all alone, starved, cold, and scared. But he was alive, and nobody chased him anymore. Sam got out of the swamp and walked east through the front line, hiding in the forest, the way he was taught by his best friend, ISA. Then, he found Betty. Betty hugged Sam tight, and they cried. 